Hey everybody, Peter from City Lights here, welcoming you to day two of 20 in 2020, a special edition of City Lights Live, celebrating the anniversary of the Spotlight Poetry Series and the publishing of the 20th volume in our signature collection. City Lights Live is the virtual reading series that continues in the footsteps of our in-store calendar during the shelter in place. We continue to celebrate the works of authors we know and love with readings, discussions, and forums throughout the fall season. So we're especially excited today to be celebrating books that we actually publish. As many of you know, City Lights is a publishing house as well as a bookstore. We continue to publish in the grand tradition of Lawrence Ferlegetti seminal Pocket Poets series. We publish on a regular basis, seasonal, new books of poetry, fiction, literature and translation, and nonfiction informed by a progressive political outlook. We have new titles out from David Barsamian, from Stan Cox, also a very timely book uh, by Alan Hirsch about our current electoral crisis. Uh, also a new book from the 21st Poet Laureate of the United States, Juan Philippe Herrera, uh, as well as new poetry in the Spotlight series, which we're celebrating today from Uchi Naduka and Sophia Dahlin. So to learn more about the books that we publish, as well as all of our upcoming events, please do visit us on our website at www.citylights.com. Uh, you can also keep up on our activities via social media. We've got a presence on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, you name it. Uh, you can also subscribe to our newsletter and get weekly updates uh, in your mailbox uh, about all the books that we publish, as well as up and coming events. So before we begin, I would like to remind you that City Lights has reopened its doors to the public. Following health department guidelines, we've worked hard to make your visit to City Lights as safe as possible. So please do come on down and visit us. Uh, you'll once again be able to browse our stacks. Our business hours are seven days a week from 12 noon to 8 p.m. Uh, please do note our entrance is now on the Broadway side of the building. It's at 271 Columbus. The original entrance is now an exit only. Uh, we encourage everyone to please do wear facial covering whilst visiting. We're trying to make all of our efforts to keep things as safe for everyone involved. Um, another happy development, uh, Vesuvio Cafe next door to City Lights has reopened its doors. So you'll be able to grab a cocktail and a book all in one go. Uh, they've set up tables in Kerouac Alley, so you'll be able to safe distance and enjoy your drink. So today's event, um, we're gonna be posting links in the chat function of your dashboard for you to peruse some of the spotlight titles, both new and old. So please uh, check them out. Please do buy books uh, for us to continue producing live virtual events. Uh, we need all the help we can get. We're really not out of the woods regarding COVID. So every book sale really goes towards keeping City Lights alive and thriving. So we thank you in advance for your support. Um, so to host today's event, I'd like to welcome Garrett Caples, who is the poetry editor at City Lights and a very remarkable poet in his own right. Thank you, Peter. Uh, we just, we, at the outset of the proceedings, I just wanted to make a cameo by a friend of the series, Buster Nuggets. He's my turtle, and uh, I think he was mistakenly listed on the flyer by Chris, so I thought uh, I better have him uh, show up. But Buster says hello to everyone. Okay, there we go. And now, so welcome to part two of our celebration of our contemporary poetry series, City Light Spotlight, as we've reached the milestone of 20 volumes. Thank you all for coming. We started this series in 2009 as a way to use the platform City... Uh, City Lights has to accomplish the greatest amount of good by publishing, publishing poets who are either up and coming in the poetry world or who were past masters, as it were, accomplished writers who had never had a book outside the small press community. The idea was to draw further attention to the many creative poetry scenes in this country and those small presses that are really the lifeblood of the art rather than focus on one region or group. The success of the series has been underwritten by the enormous amount of poetic goodwill accumulated over the years by Lawrence Ferlinghetti bolstered by the loyalty and generosity of Allen Ginsberg and kept humming by such titanic originals as Bob Kaufman, Diane DePrima, Frank O'Hara, and Ann Waldman. It's amazing to be able to edit a poetry series that taps into that goodwill. My own connection to City Lights began through knowing one of these titanic originals, Philip Lamantia. So I was pleased to see that the spotlight celebration began the day after what would have been his 93rd birthday. I met Philip on his birthday in 1998 in the company of Andrew Jorn and Will Alexander, both of whom we're reading today. Philip shared a birthday with his friend, Peter Maravellis, who you recognize as the man who just opened the reading. Lamantia has been cropping up for me all weekend, reminding me to acknowledge his alchemical influence on the series as a whole. Another friend of Philip's who's in the audience, Stephen Fama, 
usually commemorates Philip's birthday with a post on his blog, which is called the Glade of Theoric or Ornithic Hermetica. This year, he drew attention to a poem that first appeared in Lamantia's 1967 Selected Poems in the Pocket Poet series, and I can't resist reading it here. It's called After the Virus. Am I happy? Were I happy? Zoos of happiness converge on horrors, which is a wide palm of who calls first from the lips underscore. Happiness not a constant state. The field of man's gore makes bone shine further to the suicide machine. We make the sacrifice tree grow for its necessary leavens burnished with an ecstatic smile of pain. The oscillations escalate. Not a moment of happiness, but contradicted by the black undertow. What then is coming to be from underground from undergrounds too fast in their bright plumages, flailing our brains with the, gnash, with the gash of birth. Something storing mercurial islets and fungi of being and sold for altars pitched to the stars. I like how this poem ends because it somehow adds a defiant note of triumph at the end of an otherwise dark meditation. So it seems like a poem well suited to our present cultural moment. And speaking of our present cultural moment, I'd like to ask the audience to please consider buying a spotlight volume today as we're by no means out of the woods due to the effect of the pandemic and City Lights could use your support. To hear something you like from poets whose book you don't have, or you know a particular poet in the series but not another one, consider checking them out. The link to the Spotlight webpage will appear in the comments section. And I urge everyone to order directly from City Lights. Today's event features the following poets in numerical order according to publication in the series. Andrew Joran, Cedar Saigo, Will Alexander, Julian Talamantes Berlaski, Lisa Jarneau, Ali Warren, John Coletti, Elaine Kahn, Edmund Berrigan, and Sophia Dahlin. I'll introduce each poem, put each poet individually by name, but otherwise, as we have 10 readers, I'll let the poems do the talking. Our first poet today is Andrew Jarn. Hi, so glad to be here. And Garrett, I really want to thank you for changing the literary landscape by launching the Spotlight series. It was so necessary and urgent, and you made it happen and um, so glad to see it thriving. Uh, like you, I want to honor Philip Lamantia today by reading one of his sound poems. Uh, this is a poem called Scat, uh, and it's in a made-up language, and I'm going to read it as a kind of incantation against the spirits of hatred and greed that are stalking the land. It's called Scat. Ya na ruk, alu ya lepkleb, lop amori, Tes Ogin, Tinzin Tun, U Matsini, O ye Mama, O ye Mayoma, O ye Mayoma, O ya, me ha, O me, O oi, E hamalo, O ho, ma ha, ma, ma ha, ma he, mo, mo he, O ma, he me, ma ho. Ya nakoma, eka tsa, eka tsa, ips, kagerabob, bule, ababob, amatsulab, besagong, ati, ah, lamento, insigi, chi, chi, chin, stomala, stomari, ak. And that was Philip Lamantia, uh, and reading from the collected poems of Philip Lamantia. Uh, that Garrett and I and Nancy Joyce Peters edited for University of California. Um, okay, now I'm going to read um, from my spotlight book. And behind me, you see the painting that's on the cover of my spotlight book, uh, that painting by uh, Brian Lucas, artist, musician, and poet. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to have the original here in my home. Um, so I'm going to read the last poem in the book, A equals A. Mine to ask, a mask to say, A is not A. No one ever the contrarian to answer. The moon is both divided and multiplied by water as chance, as the plural of chant. O diver, to be sea surrounded by a thought led white a blankness as likely as blackness. What is the word for getting words and forgetting? Might night write sight? I, too late to relate I and I, 
trap light and sound and sing no thing that breath can bring. Okay, and um, I'll end with a new one. Uh, this, the title of this one consists of uh, two letters and a numeral, M and eight. Uh, it's a verb, uh, might also be a license plate. I should check to see if anyone has it, uh, M and eight. Um, stand before a mirror and you become a member of another world. Stand behind a name and the world becomes a member of itself. So make a map of all the eyes you've ever met. Find a path through the mirrors of thine others. Continuity is the essence of the abyss. To radiate, leave it all behind. To emanate, stay connected to the source. Wave phantom, the ship of state. Who cares, who carries, who cures? Write your answer here on the most reflective surface. Dear observer, as space expands, never is misspelled as nerver. So the mind is blinded by perception. So reading is reanimation of the dead. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for showing us Brian's painting. And Andrew is one of two readers tonight who will be coming from the metropolis of El Cerrito. <laughs> Uh, and now from, uh, from Parks North in uh, Seattle, Washington, we have Cedar Saigo. Hello, uh, Brian's here with me too. Uh, for those of you who know and love Brian. Um, yeah, so nice to be back and reading with my, what really feels like my poetry family <laughs> in a certain way. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I'm just going to read, I'm not going to read from Stranger in Town. It feels like another lifetime ago. Um, I'm just going to read from new work, uh, like five poems. So um, this is called Liquid Crystals. And um, this is the last time I was able to be in New York City. I wrote this. Frank and Jackie live to make commercials for poetry, painting, the imagination. These are my people breathing life back into paradox. The men ride one another over the patrolled waters of the USS Ohio, or bringing an Uzi to an all-male orgy, good clean fun. Starting work on a marble temple for submarines with lighthouse signal. French can-can over high demon table. In every storyboard, the house is split level, on fire in violet. The burn marks look clean to be accidental or abandoned to some cousin's attic. They won't take care of each other, so it's lucky I am here and they know this. I have a tiny triangle shaped burn over my left wrist, throbbing and swept aside in chronic dislocation. And that one is dated uh, September 30th, 2019. Um, and this is one I wrote uh, for Kevin Killian. Uh, Dodi asked me to speak at the memorial and I couldn't quite make it. Uh, but this is called uh, Cancel Culture, the Bardo for KK. Last Supper in Skateboard Triptych, 99 billion cents with aching coral pink, rubbed too hard over Paul's knockoff shoulder vest, a crippled offense. The one that is just Christ beheaded a hundred times, Christ wandering out in Martha, spacing at Beacon, trotted out again upon the ramparts. We walk happily, spreading the Jack Spicer gospel of endless Rainier drinking. When lights out brings the thrill of furniture moving above you at 2 a.m. I cry like a baby, as if reading sheltered language writing in empirical infancy. You're making millions of copies at work to offer us all a way back in, past hallucinations, cabaret cards, degrees, back alley queer, field of crosses, acres of VHS, the quilt, Anselm reading your favorite ghost town aloud at double happiness. 
I am tripping over the entirety, your own magic thrown back on Ed Dorn and Tom Clark. That is to say, naming names and Cecilia recording and me amiably hostage again, with nothing to do but stand behind you, eyes averted, mouthing back the words. And this one is pretty super recent. Um, it's called Solarium. Uranium tinged black opal like truth. We demand the end of money as poetry demands unemployment. Always in deference to the received, freakish over imagined conduct, nightmare alleyway. It's the signature tick, the demon guardian you must slide past with your tongue that morphs as you age. Sometimes writing is waiting for a panel of clouded glass to come clean. Did I dream Sophie Tauber Arp as a silhouette sweeping a pile of Swiss francs? I remember asking workers to remove the microphone from the round room, big mistake, which the gallery may have taken as a traditional choice. Colossal visions twitch, imposing variation in rhythm, the forest through the city and back. What if I am already dead, calm, and feeling undivided? I will have to begin to make art in the old ways to even fake at breaking even. Attempt to form daylight or sing to myself and choose to retrace it. Old threads of yellow, varnished, blown to the edge of a white ravine. The scene is such, the wall itself is torn. And I'll close with one more poem. Um, this was written for a great Navajo poet named Esther Bay Lynn. And I wrote this for her. Uh, they sort of, I teach at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, Santa Fe, and they kind of forced us to show each other our reading lists. And we both had uh, Grapefruit by Yoko Ono was on our list, so. I felt very charmed by that fact and uh, less alone in sort of the academic aesthetic there. Um, this is called Instructions for Esther Bay Lynn. Tape record the snow falling and fall to sleep. Burn down a gas station, not so secretly. Hello, thank you. I want to spend eternity worn into a rock. A mask emerges, two small eyes, three poems in place of clouds. Have a party in the dark and call it a concert. I was reading over my shoulder, hearing nobody answer the bell. Map a little further out, attempt to unwind. Keep speaking in received asides. Play these four notes out of turn. Now leave the room, join the dawn and walk the city with your deadly cough, resolute in pieces. Crash against the cattail mat, peel back the tatters, see stars, count windows instead. Thank you. Thank you, Cedar. Thank you, that was great. It was nice hearing new poems. Uh, our next reader coming from LA is Will Alexander. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you, Garrett, for this uh, gathering, this uh, gathering of the family of poets. And uh, of course, thank you for Philip for putting all this together originally, bringing his yes. vibration into this series. Amazing, he still remains amazing for me. But I'm gonna read from the uh, Compression and Purity. And uh, I'll start the deluge in formation. If one believes oneself as stasis, there exists no seepage, no neural density or scar. One then saturates as ash, as pointless cannibal's lethargy, as dislodged ink from a podium or a treatise. One comes to know demobility as a craft, as an arc which solders itself to specifics. Yet to know one's not sequestered through mundane advancement as doorway or basic, basic habit as speculation. I'm speaking of chastisement or cross-referential superimposition. Within this condition, I'm more like a crow from crucial underwater fires, 
a crucial underwater crow. Neither Chinese nor Shinto, but of the black dimensionality as hidden underwater mass, which persists by daring, which seems to seems at the surface a purposeless kinetic or pointless mandrels infection. Saying such, I consider myself a reddish Shinto crow, then just as quickly a black anathema crow, then it's just as quickly a sun-fed crow from snow-washed volcanoes. So I look to myself as winter, as inclement carrion monger, as flight through great electrical haze. I being blur who shapes the Empyrean, who invokes withdrawal, who instills in his forces stunning psychic transference. And what I'll do is I'll finish with um, three small ones. And uh, I always talk about the uh, need for compression in, in the work. And uh, there's been very, a number of small poem, poems I've written. And I, as I always say, I go from two or three lines to 500 pages in a poem, but it's all based on concentration and, and focus of language via language, concentration via language. And so the uh, first poem, oh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll read one from memory. And this is, this is, this is one of my first poems that I did. And this is, this is kind of in keeping, not in keeping with the reading from the Spite Light series, but it's from the, my first volume was Vertical Rainbow Climber, published many years ago. And it's called uh, 1945. A Hiroshima housewife extracting her bones from boiling gasoline oceans on Venus. And the next poem is from the uh, City Lights uh, volume here. It's called Beginning After Existence. On the floor, there are spiders which astonish with replications which irradiate, which strike resistance, which terrify, which defoil carnivorous amoebas with each fiber, with each mandible, with each blood not gone astray. Flavor, embryonic, shifting out of red or exerted magma, threading their weight throughout a melanotic angle into ghostly osmosis. The next being uh, a zodiacal instant, which is even shorter, to coordinate tigers, to look into the bright domain of sullen deactivity, is to walk on threads, is to hallucinate navamshas. And one other, it's called amidst the liminal. In the cranial foundation, there are colors which erupt into a blankness, which reconnoiters, which erupts into ratio, into earthquake curricula, in which a form of flames spirals, frayed at its core by potentia. And I think I'll do one more here, it's a very small one. It's called another plane. Absorbing a tumbled foci, absorbing verdurous angularities with blackened electron resistance with a coiled and perfidious complication, like a fowl in a blazeless solar ocean, scattering its sound across noiseless sodium rejoinders. I thank you for the opportunity to read. Yeah, thank you, Will. Okay. Thank you. Loved hearing the throwback too from a uh, vertical rainbow climber, which was a hard book to find, but I got it. Uh, our next reader uh, is Julian Talamantas Berlaski. Julian, tell me where you're broadcasting from again, because I've forgotten where you're at. Or, or uh, Pete, can you turn Juli Julian Berlaski back on? Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to find him. One second. There we, go. there we go. Hey everyone, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, I'm broadcasting from uh, Goleta, California, Chumash territory near Santa Barbara. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, thank you, Garrett and Peter for organizing this. It's um, such an honor to read with these poets. I really, really happy. And also it's just very meaningful to me because this book, Advice for Lovers, that Garrett had published was the first person who agreed to publish a book of mine. So um, very happy to be here. Uh, I'm gonna read a new poem. It's called, If I Could, I Surely Would. Uh, this is a phrase that appears in a lot of different songs. There's an old spiritual, oh, Mary, don't you weep no more. Um, well, if I could, I surely would stand on the rock where Moses stood. And then there's a also a Carter family song. If I could, I surely would stand on that rock where Moses stood. And then I think probably the most recognizable one might be the Simon and Garfunkel song. Um, yes, I would, if I could, I surely would. So if I could, I surely would. I could fly the ocean, but I could be a fly on the wall or I could be fly as hell to no great purpose, no witness from a silver plane. I could turn it all into purple prose, the prose that reveled in its circumambulations as in circling a holy thing, as in moving sunwise around a sacred entity circularly, or with a fascinator like a duchess, neither to any purpose perambulating with an umbrella in the sun. Duck at Pleasant Lake, or was it Lake Pleasant, who kept swimming into the swimming area? If I had had the right shade of blue ink, or if I had Thalo, X11, or spectral or Uranian blue, to grind into a dust, to make an ink, to make the neck of the duck shine. I could make it rain in California. I could make a hard and tender rain fall in California and soften the brittle twigs and coat the throat of my sweet fox. I could tell you what I really think. I could lift my heart up to the tune of Be My Lover by Labouche. Be my lover, won't you be my lover? or better yet, to Blue Moon as sung by Elvis, take four, where he almost yodels, where he employs his smooth falsetto to the clippity-clop percussion of what seems like horses, or like coconuts clapped together to sound like horses, trotting along in one four time. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, the way Monty Python done, wondering whether a swallow could carry the weight of a coconut and I could eat the meat of that coconut and the dried sweet grapes of yesterday and no one could stop me and the wine would not be tinged with smoke nor the forest singed past arboration. I could use the blues to be no longer blue. I could beat back the blues if I could write. I could have written a poem beaten blue by the blues and in spite of the blues and its tinge upon the cuff of my brain. I could have been the best speller of the mall of any decade and made it be known that antediluvian Urs Brock and Feldkris would have taken me down because I bragged and needed to be brought low. Like how Ashka Coyote lets go of the mouse, how the Shumash tell it, bragging about how it outsmarted the mouse and the mouse runs away when Ashka opens its mouth. When the coyote begins to brag, when it opens its mouth to brag, if I could have taken some pleasure out of it, I might have sucked on the conch or blew on it in such a way as to make sound occur, a pleasurable sound, or one that could have called certain spirits forth or beckoned loved ones to dinner, if we could have dinner, if we could share the air together and talk with each other with our very mouths. I would cook a meal in 10 steps that could be done in four, I'd flay the skins of the vegetables myself and julienne them a la Julia, a la Julian. I'd pluck herbs from the garden I would have and mince them so finely to sprinkle over the resultant spread. And I'd visit the cranberry bog of my long desire to see the native berries in their feral habitat, once cultivated, now wilded. And I'd scoop them up in a water somewhat fresh in some way salt and that the berries too would be sweet, salty, sour, dripping in my palms, I could have tasted them 
were the water clean enough to permit even an overbearing caretaker to allow their dog companion to dip its paws and then lick those paws. I would lick them. I would lick my paws and berries the way the tongue would circle the beloved jewel of the star Antares. Antares that winks like the dark orchid of my asshole where the gem of Arcturus is genital shining in Boötes, herald of the eve in buttery yellow. I would fall into the butter dish and revel there and carry gold like the sun nearing the money shot. Even in the east where such things are rare, there would be a beach, Magansett Beach, west facing, and a dune where we would lie protected among the seagrass and the rose hips. Yes, I would. Yes, yes. And if I could, I would. And if I could, I surely would. As the song says, stand on that rock where someone or other stood. Rock with the remnants of ancient creatures who still hear with ears, who hear us yet with ossified ears, even as the soul of my estate, unhinged and maskless, but grander and canarier, was in the burning west. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Our next reader coming, I believe, from Queens? Nope. Uh, Jackson Heights. Oh, Jackson Heights. That's uh, you know, not same city, <laughs> uh, is Lisa Jarneau. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Garrett. Um, great to be here with everyone. I, I was just thinking, wow, I, I, I wish I was a poet. <laughs> it's been so long, but uh, here we are. Um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna read one poem, uh, uh, an an old poem, um, which uh, came to mind. Uh, well, first let me say uh, I hope everyone here will go over to the City Lights website and pick up some books today. I I'm gonna do that because I went to my bookshelf to to pull out my City Lights book and it's not there. I don't even have a copy of it. So I'm about to order a couple copies from you guys. Uh, so that, that's my challenge to everyone tonight. Um, I'm gonna read one poem, it's called The Bridge. Um, and um, it came to mind because um, two, two friends here uh, contributed to its existence, um, Cedar and Eddie. The Bridge. That there are things that can never be the same about my face, the houses, or the sand. That I was born under the sign of the sheep. That like Abraham Lincoln, I am serious, but also lacking in courage. That from this yard, I have been composing a great speech. That I write about myself, that it's good to be a poet. That I look like the drawing of a house that was penciled by a child, that curiously I miss him and my mind is not upon the Pleiades, that I love the ocean and its foam against the sky, that I am sneezing like a lion in this garden that he knows the lilies of his Nile, distant image, breakfast, a flock of birds and sparrows from the sky, that I am not the husband of Cassiopeia, that I am not the Southern fish, that I'm not the last poet of civilization, that if I want to go out for a walk and then to find myself beneath a bank of trees weary, that this is the life that I had. That curiously, I miss the sound of the rain pounding on the roof and also all of Oakland, that I miss the sounds of sparrows dropping from the sky, that there are sparks behind my eyes on the radio and the distant sound of sand blasters and breakfast and every second of it geometric smoke from the chimney of the trees where I was small. That in January, I met him in a bar. We went home together. There was a lemon tree in the backyard and a coffee house where we stood outside and kissed. That I have never been there curiously and that it never was the same. The whole of the islands or the paintings of the stars, fatherly tied to sparrows as they dropped down from the sky. Oh, rattling frame where I am. I am where there are still these assignments in the night to remember the texture of the leaves on the locust trees in August under the moonlight rounded through a window in the hills. 
that if I stay beneath the pole star in this harmony of crickets that will sing, the bird sound on the screen, the wide eyes of the owl form of him still in the dark, blue, green, with shards of the Pacific, that I do not know the dreams from which I have come, sent into the world without the blessing of a kiss, behind the willow trees, beside the darkened pansies on the deck beside the ships rocking, I have written this across the back of the sky, wearing a small and yellow shirt near the reptile house, mammalian, no bigger than the herd. That I wrote the history of the war waged between the Peloponnesians and the South, that I like to run through shopping malls, that I've also learned to draw, having been driven here, like the rain is driven into things, into the ground, beside the broken barns, by the railroad tracks, beside the sea. I, Thucydides, having written this, having grown up near the ocean. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. I want to uh, mention too, while I think of it, uh, the cover artist of Lisa's book, the woman named Sylvia Fine, and uh, she is about to turn 101, and she's still uh, she's still rocking it. She had a, uh, a a show a year ago at the uh, at the Berkeley Art Museum, and uh, <clears throat> she's still still among us. Uh, so our next poet, also from the beautiful metropolis that is El Cerrito, is Allie Warren. Thanks, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure and honor to read. Uh, for everyone in this series. Um, Spotlight published uh, my first book, Here Come the Warm Jets, uh, in 2013, which was um, felt like a real privilege. And um, it just published um, my new book, Little Hill, in the spring. And that's what I'm going to read from, um, just a few selections from the title poem. Like any animal, I need something in the morning to rouse me the joy of my friends against this fidelity investments notebook, a gift from my brother I use for its hard back to rouse me, to lose myself against image, against the trading brokerage of choice. I need a patch, I need a sticker, I need a sticker in a new world. No splendor untainted. Is this morning naive, selfish? to want the apple to propagate itself, to want the syrup and the songs. I do not believe we know what will come of any action considered or directed or righteous as it may be. Desire is not will. Fidelity to what? There must be pleasure. Eating and shitting and fighting and fucking with this marking and with this fire, knowing the thing by its disappearance, waiting in noxious waters bathing in the backwash of our cities. My phone beeps, I read the news. We used to throw trash into the ocean. We're more subtle now. I slip into my microfiber. I get ready for work. I stick the branch in the ground like you told me. I did it, I did it. I placed the root in the ground. I don't wanna live as if living were a way of acquiring things. Never let it be said that sitting in the sun is not a pastime. Star soaked and breezing under the hill, yellow pistol blazing, but can we eat it? The bay goes on. I wake up to it buzzing west of the highway, full and fragrant as ever. No malicious force has set a drain to it. I closed my eyes for eight straight hours and no one drained the bay. Though being wakeful is no guarantee against drainage. Things can and do disappear all the time. Does the forest know its distance from shore? To what force it owes its green? Things can and do disappear all the time. Depicted in this diagram is a baby contemplating an egg. It does not seem to me to be a human egg, but what do I, what have I ever known? Having never been inside my own body, Mutual exclusivity is an invention, she says confidently. It never occurred to me someone had to be the first to say it. I prefer the coextensive. I prefer languid feasts, fetting what is insightful and generous and kind. What's the line? You should praise me. Who said that? 
I praise the sea. Cracking open the country to get at the yoke, calling it finance, calling it the market requires, yanking all the edibles away like a magician with their tablecloth. You can't eat a useless nest of microcredit sealed in a silo. You can't eat mountains of smoke and candied cancer gems. They train the cadre to believe hunger is the result of laziness. Every few days they shovel it off and repitch it. The cruisers crush the flowers to produce an object lesson. The cruisers parade the street, crushing the flowers. Is a hole in the head needed? A hole in the head is not needed. Inextricably bound, pushed out, never intended to survive, head fast into a parallel hole, on it, in it, or near it. I have never seen a shirt of nettles, nor a nettle shirt, to sting the body of a boss with. Evaporative star, anticipatory blue, where is my coat? Where is my outing? All this work and no tub to bathe it off. My love asks, what's a sunset pig? All these years I just assumed. I go on assuming, pushing down afterthoughts through no mind of my own. The stakes are myself. I'm more than a breathing apparatus, a job to lance me to it. The stakes are see-through. See them there? Thank you. Thank you, Allie. That was great. And I want to just uh, flash Allie's book up on the screen here. Um, Allie's book came out in uh, February or March. And so I just want to encourage people to check this out because that was a terrible time for anything to come out. And it's a really amazing book. So uh, please, uh, please uh, acquire it. Um, our next poet coming from Brooklyn, weighing in at a really good poet. <laughs> it is John Coletti. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to wish Allie Warren, a birthday, happy birthday on Tuesday to begin with. That was amazing. Um, and yeah, this is reading with this group is mind blowing. Um, thank you so much to Garrett and everyone at City Lights for publishing Deep Code uh, five or six years ago. I grew up in San Rosa, California, going to City Lights since I was a child. So that meant everything to me. Um, so I'm gonna read one long poem from that, but I'm also I'm gonna start with one opening poem from this book. Um, Peppermint Oil that just came out from Push. And much gratitude to Jason Morris and Jason Velasquez. The first poem of the book. The Night Gardener. Sometimes the flowers get so big I have to snap them and put them in another vase. I heard geese kick other geese in the sky or cats maybe both, burnt flannel and sharp shale edges, grudges of real sky, and then they're happy. That bit of false pottery, protesting light, impossible to read in muted night. And this poem, maybe this is the last time I read it for a long time, is called State Name. State Name of pleasure, to connect physically, powerfully, that I love you with the power of another talking to and will let you touch my lips, make them stop, bonicue, light bulb in the shape of grotesque water lily, awful steel Mephistophelian lilt, loose white muscles, my ears, breathing orange irises with a good chest shave, vampire gatherer, Bulse, Campari bulse, peacock feather earrings, apricot brandy up the neck, in sharp eggshell, armadillo till, wisps of untidy hair hanging from the wall, putting on my old clothes, inner Griswold Thurman accordion. They know the end is meanestly meaningless because I break free. You heard me, you heard what I said. Burnt ash eyelashes. Through a tiger on a bike, club little ends stuck together, 
for supreme sense of structure. The world is not his, mine, or ice exposure with veins I don't fit in, an adorable photograph you keep behind, a menagerie of things. We refuse to move, though clash and clutter, together in the cornflakes, little grain sugar, sneaking around broken trains, bored with the recipe, blowing superior raspberries, you never grow, just results. Poet is fuck right now with painting at Julia's in low cut Grecian dress, looking into a mirror pole, the whole canvas falling into and crashing the disturbance, the ripple inside pleasure. One dark red braid of sea I dreamt last night, her eyes had that extra left them in them, an insecure penny full of quitting streams, waving a cigar gas mask back at the Republic. Every head turning, on an unwiped sooty table, flecked on mirror globe, peeling potatoes in Delphian light. Her bonnet, the benefit of surviving Twix, frozen rolls, sexualized years, the inside winter, stacked and forgotten. I'm doing exactly what I'm meant to be doing, waiting to desperate, give in forever. Life isn't only for the final 15. I wonder, do I stop pressing these buttons right here, reducing humility? into caricature, a shabby sheepdog encased in an unrippable foil. Lidl in the permafrost, itching elbows to reduce tension, thighs belching to the assembled virtues of your past empty cells. Meanwhile, young people die for lack of true results. That alpha pair destroying hardened unto weak bigotry, our nerves or others, their biases. Impatient, not ours but wholly sanctioned by the cartoon of our culture, severely mismanaged and perverted by the switch on the broken crucifix of unspeakable conscience. Bed closet after closet of misguided fashion, shivers from a misfed arc, watching me be on top of somebody, on top of someone else, anyone. Am I gonna learn tonight to be the proper shame? The one who counts? Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you. All right. Our next reader, I think, is reading from LA, but she'll tell me if I'm wrong because she is peripatetic. Uh, last time I checked, you were in LA, but it is Elaine Khan. Where are you? Where are you at, Elaine? I'm actually in Rhode Island right now, but I oh. still live in LA. I'm just visiting oh. my parents. Okay. But thanks for recognizing I move a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um. Thank you. I mean, thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Peter, for having me. Thank you, all the readers. And thank you, City Lights. Um, I actually, I didn't just, uh, City Lights published my first book, but I also worked at City Lights. It was my job right out of college. I worked in the bookstore for like three years. I applied to all of my grad school programs in the basement of City Lights. Suzanne was like the first person I told when I found out I was getting into grad school. So it's, this is such a special reading and it's City Lights is such a special place. So I do encourage everyone to buy some books from City Lights. Um, all right, I'm gonna read uh, a poem from my Spotlight series book called The Painting in Modern Life. Am I loud enough? Yep. Okay, good. Um, the Painting in Modern Life. I watch the men show muscles through the trees their hairless chests reflecting sunlight slow as glass. They walk transparent and return each time to the same point. On the other hand, I rush to be unwise. A blot of ink blots out my stomach, still button of a clock, a set of teeth perched on a camera stand, a plastic chalice. I don't give a fuck about the sun. I only have eyes for blow up dolls. I put pomade on my sternum, winding up the saddle as a hairless Siamese lays scratching in its corner. While we're stacked and straddling the branch, I whisper right now, my vagina is closer to your ass than it is to mine. And it is true. 
Isn't that the way love's supposed to be? A blurry shadow of a group of people moving all together. I'm a girl and I'm a woman and a boy and a baby and a motorcycle and a fuzzy greenish picture of Jesus. I contain my piss into the helmet, begging you to watch me, tracing skulls above your head, emojis whistle like a flame. He's a rebel, I was blind. He's a rebel, now he's mine. I understand that my agenda made this awkward. I meant it only as an act of aesthetic interference. Don't you get it? My single insurrection in this life is my fertility. Yesterday, I polished seven pairs of boots. It was really something. And uh, I'm gonna read a poem from my book that just came out in February. It was a bad time to have things come out. <laughs> it's called Romance or the End, it's on Soft Skull. You can buy it from City Lights. <laughs> uh, I told you I was sick. The innocents all dress the same, their mouths open, their mouths close. They flush and bleed and wonder where they are, happy to be leaving, hesitant and unprepared for the departure when it comes to them like penicillin. Are you pinching yourself? what I want and how I want it. That is what they told me. They were right. Skin is just like fabric and all violence is in defense of something. I lay on my back and wish. I do that now. I wish for good things, all the good, good things. Why not? Fabric rolls out like a cloud of paint, a moan into a square of gauze. I don't know. And so I write about it. I care about life and the ones who never say a thing. We are in the hands of Providence who is unqualified. There are those who would protect us from the possibility of good. And I'm just gonna read one more that's just brand new. Um, to suffer forever in the smallest pigsty of illuminated growth. Everything drops like aspirin, spit thin into the mat, the maggots in the shower drain, I never saw them. I don't ever touch what's left and never look at you. The lights just glow like garbage presses, personal, dissatisfied, how I arouse the type. A mini skirt, a gallery, a caption, things about the ocean, life is birthed from non-life lies, a minor key, deleting years of pleasure, years of pain, a raincoat, cactus, moral rule, experiments in cerulean and white machines. Then from the film, I wait for portioning to happen for the cut to come across and reach me life lengthening to non-life. Reality begins with the face. I pull apart the eye. Thanks. Thank you, Elaine. Return the new, new work. Our next reader, coming again from Brooklyn, is Edmund Eddie Berrigan.
Uh, not hearing you, uh, Ed. Yeah. Edmund, you might want to activate your audio because I've got you unmuted. Ooh. Let's try it again. Mm. Yeah, your your audio is uh, deactivated on your end, Edmund. I think you may need to go into preferences. Sorry, gang. <laughs> yeah, we just don't have any audio, Edmund. I'm sorry. Um. Yeah, I think we're, we've we've got some problems here. So maybe we should move on to Sophia for now. Yeah, Edmund, um, you know, Edmund, I'm, I'm going to talk to you privately. Yeah, 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 or, yeah. Or I was going to say, uh, Chris was suggesting if he quit and came back. Yeah, yeah. Let's yeah, try that. Care of it. But meantime, what we'll do, we'll shuffle real quick, and uh, uh, maybe yeah, Peter and Eddie can work that out in the background. And meantime, let me have uh, uh, our newest spotlight. Uh, Volume, uh, Sophia Dolan, uh, give us a reading here. Hi, everybody. Can Hello. you hear me? Yes. Yay. Um, I, uh, yeah, uh, I was going to rehearse all through Edmund's reading. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I'm so excited to be reading with, uh, with these poets. Um, I feel so grateful, Garrett, to you for publishing my book, but I also feel so grateful to you for publishing all of these poets. And I feel like there's so many senses in which um, if, if these books did not exist, then my book would not exist. You know, I, I, have, I have been reading this Spotlight series um, and I will keep reading it, I believe, uh, and, uh, and keep, keep being made by it. So thank you. Um, I also, also wanted to share, like Andrew Jordan, I have my book cover with me too. Uh, so, but I keep mine um, hidden because it looks at me, which is disconcerting. So I'm gonna read. Um, I'm gonna read something newish, and then I'm gonna read uh, the still newish work that is my book, um, Love Money. I need money to buy gloves, so that I never need again to touch it. Money. I need gloves to separate my hands from dollars, also from other hands. When they hand me money, handling others' money, others' hands, disgusting and cold or hot. To regulate mine own hands, temperatures, gloves. To buy them, money. What would be most ideal would be to have the gloves already. Somebody, I need you to hand me some gloves, to hand me some money there in the glove store. So I may hand that money in my glove to the cashier there, whose name is French for cashier, and she will handle me the coins I'll catch in my leather palm or velvet palm or artificial breathable fibers like Lance Armstrong, an athlete of my time. I would like enough money for gloves, enough gloves for money, and two hid hands held by my secret skin. Once, before I knew I was a kind of lesbian, when I just liked boys, I mean, when I was but a board, I mean, when I despised my own thin, small-boned chest, I saw on her we were in somebody's driveway in full sun, a classmate wore a hand, a little charm on a chain, palm down penny length ornament that rested past her clavicle above her breasts. It is the part I now know I love to touch the best, just where the fat starts. I stood though dumbstruck, not knowing 
not knowing yet that I am a hand and my sex is a hand, I thought how erotic, how could it be so erotic? How secret her necklace touches her, she wears the touch in public. All right, let's get the good stuff, the printed stuff. Uh, under away. When it pushes shadow from the trees and presses it from their needles outside the dye house and the bus is dark inside, when it picks apart the lawn and you are here, will you soften me for the sun? Will you deflect it? I am blinking in the atrium, the library. I don't know if you have a room for me or where on me you can lie down. But I want my anger easily exhausted. The way fact takes the rug from an argument. We both go on the floor. I do feel your shade, your wavy boughs. You dream you are leaving me. I would become an ordinary person if you did that you are awake and I am ordinary anyway and it pushes through me. Now we'll read the last poem in the book and the title is that. In winter pancakes, in the summer's butter, spring in which is better, Autumn's what the summer must. I take it up with time and season weeps me. Homey weather sacks the soup. The bucks are anywhere, but anyone who lived for art, died poor or married rich, which would be the death of me. I fold in the library my patent shoes, scallop to heel to toe the dance they choose the beverage was clearly there not a drink if standing in document reverb in the west a goose the bad tree that fell toward me followed me into me we made reverse dryad and they teased it out of my skin in heartthrob bebop, in leggings lakes, in me the dual runnings of a one, a two who wants to be more freely yours, the magma hops, the new year earneth over. Thank you. Thank you, Sophia. Um, Pete, did we get um did we get Eddie back on? I think I so. Uh, Eddie, I think I heard you. Yeah, yeah. we got him. Oh, good. I'm sure. Am I here? Yes. Yes. Am I here for you all as well as for myself? <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all the wonderful readings. Um, like everybody said, it's great to, to be in this group of people that are constellations across my whole life. Um, uh, when I was first becoming, well, I would call it my fifth attempt at becoming a poet when I was like 15 or 16. But the one that stuck, I was um, was inspired by uh, an episode of Quantum Leap with, with uh, Jack Kerouac characterized on it. But I happened to be sitting next to copies of uh, scattered poems and poems all sizes by the real Jack Kerouac and, and published by City Lights. And, um, and those were just some of my... I can't say my first because I was hearing poetry for in my childhood, but I, you know I bonded with with those poems sonically and in the sense that there's stuff going on between the words that's uh, just as important as the words themselves, and sometimes more revealing, sometimes more obscure, but you know obscurity is its own kind of truth in this strange world we live in. So I'm going to read from my book. Uh, more gone, uh, and this one is called Home. A personal experience of pattern variation with a little cup on its back. How did you come up with mercy? Lenses of ash and charcoal, 
a cultural body that resides in the domain of loss. Days are a shifting of light and I'm used through it. Inheritance of opposition, further transitions are also hinted at. We don't equate foreign lives with our own. Showed up where everyone seemed to be a port of understanding, an entity of exclamation she recognized within herself. It's a shame I let it hurt me so. Celebrity births occur, sleepy works, an aggressiveness I've never had. Sensory records persist, hilarious truths, and a gold-breasted sandpiper follow me. An interior landscape full of spectacular diseases, odd that works become true. Home is a place of permanent work, an element of contagion pausing the gift, picking up fragments to move. Little pieces continue as pieces. A man says, I am this, standing on it. A woman says, this is unforgivable. This will be destructed or not, a style of moment we have. Sometimes we share this. I talk to the taxi driver, offer some directions. I can believe 50% of what you say, he says, and laughs. We are both named Buddy. <laughs> Great cabbies mutter in foreign languages and sing to themselves. I keep thinking I am two years older than I am, getting farther from my youth, but I am also just in one extended moment. I hope when I close my eyes, you are still there, and so am I. I find you on a street corner. Another one is chasing his kid in that playground. The gray kitty rests nearby. How is your extended moment, I ask? But now we are just words going over a bridge whose shadows make us more and less clear. This grammar is not something I will pretend to control or master. I have no project but contention and the monument is already there as we fade into it. And just one more, this is recent uh, from August. Um, this is called Buffalo Days. Have you ever washed dishes in a restaurant before? It hadn't occurred to me to say yes. All that occurred to me was to get an eggplant parm and cherry crush and return to the recliner to watch TV or to read the Jane Austen compendium I'd acquired from a used bookstore. I'd read it in the attic between foosball matches. Sabina's long legs strode down the middle of Allen Street. Hakeem wasn't out yet. Greg and Ben's wrists were sore from long hours of scooping ice cream. I wanted to write a poem as long as Elmwood Avenue, but I rarely got beyond a page. Shane walked in without any pants on. I got a job for an hour and a half selling storm windows. I was on the bus when I decided to skip the job interview, but I left my wallet on the bus and I ran after it for 10 blocks. Ho told me that he liked Elizabeth Bishop, so I wrote her name in my notebook. I have no memory of coming or going, though I do recall Greg's dad driving us eight hours straight. He and mom volleyed like tennis players about the Balkan crisis over dinner. What did we even have? Anselm and I discussed our poems for the very first time on a second story porch. We drank 40s and Anselm made cold canned ravioli. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Eddie. Thank you everyone for coming out to the reading and thank you for everyone who showed up to read. It's just that there's a real thrill to get uh, the entire series in, in these two days. It's just been really wonderful for me. So I just thank everyone for uh, coming through. And yes, uh, thank the audience. Uh, if you can, go buy a book. Uh, if you can't, no, no problem. It's still fun. <laughs> so uh, uh, I think that's about it for us. So um, uh, thank, thank you again for coming. And uh, we, will, uh, we will keep it going. <laughs> See you later. <laughs>
You're amazing, Will. No, uh, thank you. Love your thank work you. so much. <laughs> Love hearing you. Love your work as well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> bye, everybody. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye, bye. Thank you, Garrett. Everyone, Peter. All the great reading.